Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister. Friends and fellow Singaporeans, my subject this year is remaking Singapore. I've decided to start by remaking the National Day Rally. <laughs> Last year, I finished at 11:30. So this year, we start at 6:45. <laughs> we'll do Chinese, Malay, Chinese, with subtitles, so everybody will understand what I'm saying. Take a break. Do the English at eight o'clock, and we'll have supper by ten o'clock. <laughs> Friends and fellow Singaporeans, forty years ago, we set out into an uncertain future. We didn't know what lay ahead, but we determined to survive and to build a better future for ourselves. Today, Singapore is totally different. In four decades, we've succeeded beyond anybody's imagination. People live well. Our children are well educated. We are friends with our neighbours, and most important of all, we are maturing as a nation. One test of this was when a tsunami hit our neighbours last December. Ordinary Singaporeans responded overwhelmingly, in cash, in kind, volunteering to help. Our volunteers in the NGOs, our doctors and nurses, our SAF and civil defence servicemen, they carried out rescue and relief operations under very difficult conditions. There are so many stories which could be told. But I have to choose one to represent all the things we did. In Bandar Aceh, the air traffic control tower at the airport was damaged by the earthquake and the tsunami. They needed the airport operational so that relief supplies could fly in. We had a mobile air traffic control tower in Singapore. We disassembled it, packed it into aeroplanes. Flew it to Banda Aceh, arrived at 11 o'clock at night, unloaded it, assembled it, made it operational 5 a.m. the next morning. Our response to the tsunami won us respect as well as friendship. It showed the world that our people and our organisations, our outfits. They are competent, effective, always ready. They showed that we cared for others and would do our best to help when our friends are in need. And so, when the operation completed and we left, we left friends. In Malabo, where we did, where we were busiest, Liu Qihian went for the farewell ceremony when the SAF sailed away. Colonel Gehan. Who was the army, Indonesian army commander, who was in Malabo when, and responsible for it? Hugged him, three bear hugs. <laughs> and we left behind 16,000 school bags in Malabo, in Bandarache, in Phuket, in Sri Lanka, for the children so that they can start their lives again. Gifts. With tags handmade by our school children, and in Indonesia, every bag carried a little piece: one red and white Indonesian flag, one red and white Singapore flag. So I think we have friends as a result of this. It's a great tribute to the men and women who took part. Your teamwork and spirit made it possible, and you made us all proud to be Singaporeans. Some of you are here tonight. May I ask you to rise and stand and be recognised?
Vi ska nu gå. Another sign that we are maturing as a country is that I think young Singaporeans now understand what it takes for us to survive as a nation. Two weeks ago, I was here in this cultural centre watching a National Day musical review, All for Love, put on by Lim Sui Se's uh, grassroots and the GRC. Very high quality production. But the cast were all volunteers. It's a National Day production, so National Day stories. As Lim Sui Se said at the end of the story, his tissue box was empty. <laughs> but what registered, what caught my eye was the cast. The youngest member was an 11-year-old girl, primary five, Patty Lim was her name. And they produced a program book. So I flipped through and I found in the program book what Patty Lim had said for her birthday wish for Singapore. To have a constant supply of water. <laughs> and I also wish for peace in Singapore. So I give her and her national education teacher full marks. <laughs> As a small country, we pay close attention to making friends abroad and ensuring Singapore's security. We are on good terms with all the important countries in the region, with our immediate neighbours, Malaysia and Indonesia. I have established relationships with the leaders, President Yudhoyono and Prime Minister Abdullah Badawi, and we are working together, cooperating in many areas. We are investing in Malaysia, and you see Malaysia is investing in Singapore. They recently bought some shares in, I think, M1. We are happy at that. In ASEAN, we are growing our linkages on a broad front, talking about an ASEAN community by 2020, hopefully sooner. Beyond that, India, Japan and Australia are good friends with us. In the Middle East, Senior Minister Go Chok Tong has been very busy expanding ties, visiting, cultivating them, developing a relationship which we will need for the long term. And our relations with China are back on track. And with EU and America, our relations are good. So we are friends with all the key players which matter to us. They are not all friends with one another all of the time. And they have various problems amongst themselves. But with Singapore, we are on good terms with them. And that's a comfortable state of affairs to be in. One security issue which we have to worry about is terrorism. The London bombings remind us all, if we needed any reminder, that this threat is real, is live. And so we have to take precautions and do our utmost to prevent anything untoward from happening in Singapore. Well, so you see, even for a National Day rally, long process before we can all sit in here tonight. Policemen, Gurkhas, roadblocks, sentries, scans, but necessary, we have to take it with the utmost seriousness, because the terrorists have not given up. But we have to be psychologically prepared. If ever something happens here, we've got to remain unshaken, respond promptly, efficiently, calmly, and press on as one united people, just like the British did when there were the bombings on the London Tube in July. Most important of all, we must not let the terrorists destroy our hard-won racial and religious harmony and social cohesion, the fabric of our society, which we've built up over 40 years. And that's why the answer to the terrorists is not just security measures and bomb scanners, but also nation-building. What will Singapore be like 40 years from now? I can't tell you. Nobody can. But I can tell you, it must be a totally different Singapore. Because if it is the same Singapore as it is today, we are dead. We will be irrelevant, marginalized, the world will be different, and we will 
You may want to be the same, but you can't be the same. Therefore, we have to remake Singapore. Our economy, our education system, our mindsets, our city. I will start with the economy because that's how we earn a living for ourselves. In fact, last year I wanted to start with the economy. But my ministers told me, everybody knows you make economic speeches, say something else. But I'm coming back to the economy this year because in fact that's the root of how we will solve all our other problems. Asia is rising, the tide is rising, we will benefit from this flood tide. It's far better for us to be in a region where our neighbours are growing and opening up opportunities for us than it is to be in a region where our neighbours are stagnant and we hope to make our living because we are doing a little bit better than them. I know that many Singaporeans are concerned about competition. It's understandable because everywhere in the world, people are worried about competition, anxious about livelihoods. I was in America in July. The economy is doing well. The unemployment is down. Hundreds of thousands of jobs are being created every month. And yet, the mood is worried, uncertain, anxious. And the political leaders are anxious because if people are worried when things are good, what more when things are down? In Europe, they are fearful of competition too. Not just competition from China or India, even competition within Europe. So the French had a referendum and on the European Constitution and it lost. And one of the reasons was they were worried about competition from the Eastern European countries. So the Polish plumber became the icon because it's a new country, they are paid less, they work harder, they are going to cause all Frenchmen to go out of work. Even in China, as I explained just now in my Chinese speech, people face fierce competition. Amongst themselves, 1,300 million Chinese workers. Lim Sui Se had a good explanation of why people are worried. I will explain it to you. Not as good as Sui Se, but I will try. He says, this is a cheaper and better argument. There are countries in the world which are cheaper than us. We are better than them. There are countries in the world which are better than us. We are cheaper than them. But now the countries which are better than us are getting cheaper, and the countries which are cheaper than us are getting better. <laughs> and the scissors are closing and we are in the middle. And if we don't jump out and do something, we are going to be squeezed. But we are not going to stay there. We didn't get here by doing nothing. We started with nothing and we made this. We started with mosquito coils, exporting them. We went on to make semiconductors. We started with bihun makers. Now we have the biopolis. So we have to continue to change and to stay ahead of the game. And there are two major thrusts that we are going to continue to grow and prosper. The well, first is a foster innovation and enterprise and the second is R&D. Let me talk about innovation and enterprise first. It's the one strong lesson which I took away after visiting Las Vegas. I spent one night and one day there. Didn't win a cent, didn't lose a cent. But what I learned is that out of nothing, in a desert, they've built a city, 40 million people visit there every year. What is it? Imagination, enterprise, drive, organization. So you imagine the result. You imagine what people want. You conceive and put together all the pieces. The restaurants, the food, the spas, the golf course, the entertainment, and of course the gambling. And you present it in a way which people come, enjoy, and say, this is good. I will tell my friends and I will come back. And what made it? Innovation and enterprise, the human imagination. I'm not saying that Singapore wants to become Las Vegas. I think we don't want to become Las Vegas, but we should learn from that spirit 
and take what is relevant for us. I think we have some of that. We have homegrown companies which are using their creativity, knowledge, and ideas to carve out niches for themselves and new markets for themselves. You've heard about the big ones, OSIM, Creative, High Flux. So I will tell you some interest, one interesting story about small ones. SMEs in an out-of-the-way place, East Timor. Two years ago, DPM Tony Tan visited East Timor. We had SAF soldiers there serving with the UN, so he visited the troops. And General Lim Chuan Po, who was then uh, Chief of Defense Force, he's here somewhere tonight, he accompanied Dr. Tony Tan. While he was there, he got a phone call. His former SAF NS driver in the division. So he asked the driver, what are you doing here? The driver says, I'm doing business here. I heard the UN were here, the foreigners were here, they needed service. I came, so selling oil, lubricants, electronic goods, opened a little cafe in Delhi Airport. At first, he couldn't speak a word of Bahasa. So to communicate with his business people, he used a calculator. You do the sums, you show, <laughs> and you do subtractions, additions. But over time, he learned Bahasa, picked it up without lessons. And now he's doing okay. So he told Lim Tuan Po, his attitude was, Kakato, just do it. So he wasn't the only one. There are about 10 or 20 of them there, and they went to the airport to meet and Dr. Tony Tan. So Tony reported. They asked him for nothing. But they said, please keep the SF, SAF here a little bit longer. <laughs> because from time to time, there are riots in this place, and we need somebody to protect us. So we need innovation and enterprise. Secondly, we have to exploit R&D, knowledge. We built up this economy based on efficiency, based on cost-effectiveness. We work well, we squeeze costs down, minimize waste. And so we attracted multinationals who come here. They provided the enterprise. We got the jobs. Now you have to go beyond efficiency. You must still be efficient, but you must now develop and exploit knowledge, R&D. Compete on the basis of knowledge and innovation and talent, and not just on costs. And that way, we can move the economy to the next level. I give you an example of three companies, say what I mean. Philips, Samsung, and Sony. All three electronics companies. They all started off doing consumer electronics. Philips went for R&D, medical products, so medical instruments, sophisticated software inside, high margin, high knowledge content. Samsung is in handphones, but fancy handphones, a lot of innovation and design. So their color screens, their built-in cameras, one new model every few days. And they've built themselves a big market share and profitable. Sony is consumer electronics, high volume, low margins. In fact, in, loss, in recent years, they suffer losses. So we have to become, adopt a strategy like Samsung and like Philips. So over the last year, I asked Dr. Ta, Dr. Tan to chair a ministerial committee on research and development. And they've studied it in depth, visited many of their countries, made their recommendations. And the government has accepted their recommendations. Two big ones. One is to set up a council, a research, innovation and enterprise council, to advise the government on research and innovation strategies, and to include people from the private sector, from academia, people from the scientific community, and also the key ministers to be involved in it so that you can get the lessons firsthand. And secondly, to set up, set up a national research foundation to fund and long-term research in strategic areas. We've accepted these recommendations. This has to be a national effort backed by the whole government and with the cooperation of the private sector. So I've decided that the Research, Innovation and Enterprise Council, I will chair myself. The National Research Foundation Dr. Tony Tan has agreed to chair, and he will also be the deputy chairman of the RIEC, the Research and 
uh, Innovation and Enterprise Council. And he will help me to drive this effort and continue to do so after he steps down as DPM at the end of this month. I'm very grateful to Tony because he stayed on to help me through this transition year. He's done major projects, the R&D review, coordinating national security, setting up the, the system for looking after our national security, overseeing university education, and now agreeing to contribute after stepping down. He has many more contributions to make to Singapore. Thank you, Tony. So innovation, enterprise, and R&D, these are the ways to remake the economy. There are risks in this approach. We are a small country. We can't bet on every number on the table. We have to back certain positions. But we have to do this. And if we succeed, we will gain a competitive edge, which will put us ahead for 15 or 20 years to come. Not forever, but long enough for us to make a living and to work out the next step forward, and therefore to create jobs and prosperity for Singaporeans. When we talk about economic growth, it's for a social purpose, because with growth, we generate resources, and with the resources, we can deal with our social objectives, the things we want to do, achieve goals, make progress together. We can deal with adjusting to a society with older Singaporeans. Last year I spoke about younger Singaporeans, so this year I shall talk about older Singaporeans and their concerns. We can help low-income Singaporeans to make sure nobody is left out. And also we can make sure that healthcare will be affordable, which I will talk about briefly at the end. Let me start with the question of providing for the needs of older Singaporeans. We are a society which is rapidly aging. If you are just within Singapore, you may not notice it because it happens day by day, gradually. But if you are a foreigner, come here for the first time. The shock is palpable. Alima told me she went on a walkabout one day and in the market met an Indonesian maid, just arrived in Singapore. The maid says to her, Ibu, saya lihat di Singapura, banyak orang tua. <laughs> in other words, man in Singapore, an awful lot of old people. And in Indonesia, it's not like that. So I think we have to adjust. There are many issues which are involved in adjusting to becoming an older society, a silver society. Sounds better. But today I will focus only on one of them, and that is on how to get people to work longer. We can't retire at 55 and then live on to 80 or more. It's okay if you retire at 55 and you live on for 5, 10 years while well, you enjoy your grandchildren. But to work for 30 years of your life and then to cool heels for 25 more years, I think you will go gaga. <laughs> Cannot be done. You have to work longer. It's not easy. But the key to changing this is attitudes. The workers' attitudes as well as the employers' attitudes. Let me talk first about the workers' attitudes. The older workers have to learn to adjust, adapt, learn new skills, accept temporary jobs, contract work, and go with the world with what is available and what they are able to do. And I know of many older workers who have made these adjustments and who have therefore been able to find jobs and remain productive with the help of enlightened employers. They have a strong determination not to give up. They stay in the job market no matter what happens. They will do it. NTUC Lifestyle magazine recently, a few months ago, had an article about such a worker. Her name is Shirley Lee. She's 63 years old. She was a clerk. She got retrenched in her 50s. She found another job. She got retrenched again. She is now 63. She has savings. Her husband is working. But they have a young son still in JC. 
and they had decided that they want to save money for the son's education for his future. So she said, I'm still fit, I can work. I will work. She tried many jobs, couldn't find an employer. So she went and got a certificate in cleaning, became a toilet cleaner. Not much pay, but she did the job. And I quote what she said. She told Lifestyle. The son asked her why I had to stoop so low and be a toilet cleaner. Wanted me to stop. I told him I see no loss of dignity in being a toilet cleaner. I'm earning my living and I'm not robbing anybody. Anyway, what else will I do at home with him so busy in school studying? So, with that sort of attitude, Word, Excel, Spreadsheet, when NTUC Lifestyle published her story, she got 71 job offers. <laughs> she chose one to work with SAGE, the Singapore Action Group of Elders, because she believed in helping others like her. So I wish her well. I think we all wish her well. The employer's attitudes are equally important. The companies have to give older workers a chance. If when the older work, when the worker rings up, you say, what's your age? Say 45. Say, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> then you can't even start. And some of the companies put up requirements, spas, front desk, receptionists. That's 40 or below. I don't understand this. If you say spa, monsieur, Work hard, 40 or below. I can understand. But front desk, you want somebody who will be able to look after the customer, to have some maturity, be reliable, loyal, patient, ready to work, experience and skill. And I think older workers have that. I think employers should change their mindsets and give older workers a chance. Older workers, sometimes employers tell me, older workers are so slow, I better pay them, don't come to work. <laughs> but I don't think it's necessarily true. They may need a mo bit more time to get used to the environment. But they are not slow. You go to a fast food joint. You say, regular Coke take away. If it's a teenager, he knows what you're talking about. If it's somebody my age, I may say, you want an economy meal or you want regular? You want to eat here or you want to go? So he says, regular Coke take away. But, <laughs> but you go to a coffee shop. You say, one kopi si kosong, one kopi kao, one te oping. No problem. Everybody gets exactly the drink which he ordered. <laughs> I think older workers can do it. There are some good employers, but we need more. SGH is one good employer. They've got 77 people whom they have re-employed after reaching retirement age. Three of them are reaching 70. How do I know? I ask them. Why did I ask them? Because I met one of these. Mr. Ng Hon Wing, he's a radiographer. That means he sets you up to take x-ray pictures. So whenever I go to SGH, very often if he's on duty, he will do me. Very efficient. He puts me up, he says, hands up, shift a bit, <laughs> hold your breath, zap, it's done. X-ray comes out, no reshoot. <laughs> I did this once overseas in a, in a very well-known hospital. A young man came, he put me on the table, he shifted the table, he moved me up, he moved me down, he turned me around a little bit. <laughs> then his supervisor came, says, no good, do again. So that's why Mr. Ng, age 70, is still able to be working productive with skills which he can impart to younger people so that they also can be as good as he is and maybe even better in time. And I think we need more people working like that and more people willing to employ workers like that.
We've got a tripartite committee working on this problem. We've got the Workforce Development Agency, the unions, the CDCs, they're all working closer to help older workers. But I think this is something which is not just policies and formulas and incentives, but mindset change. And that's why National Day Rally is subject. The other issue, the second issue I want to talk about on social issues is low-income Singaporeans, giving them a helping hand. The recent years have been hard for the low-income group. Uncertainty, retrenchments, bonuses down, overtime down. Now the economy is picking up, and I can see that the wages are going up, recruitment is going up, things are looking up again. But we still have to pay attention to this problem because I think it has not totally gone away and we must make sure that everybody enjoys the fruit of progress. And also, we have to do this to make sure that there's social mobility, that whether you're rich or poor, you have a fair chance of getting your children to do well and to move up in life. We've done a lot to help already. We've got all kinds of assistance schemes, like Comcare, particularly this year, which is a big project. We've got job redesign and recreation so that people can work smarter, be more productive, therefore earn more whether you're cleaning tables, whether you're sweeping the roads, even driving buses. And we focus on education and training to raise earning power and to make sure that in the long term, we no longer have people who are low skilled and therefore low paid. And I will talk about this some more later on. But the basic principle which we apply in helping low-income Singaporeans, which has worked well for us, and we must keep it, is we go for workfare, not welfare. That means if you work, if you are prepared to help yourself, if you are going to strive, I will help you to succeed. But if you sit back and you say, please do something for me, and the more you do for me, the less I need to do for myself, then I think we cannot do that. Because that way is perdition, is a disaster for the individual, he's demoralized, is disaster for the country. Instead of going to create wealth, you are sitting back and expecting it to fall from heaven. Cannot be done. I would like to highlight just two areas concerning low-income families tonight. One is the question of dysfunctional families. This is a group which has multiple problems. We see them in MPS. They come. One case, five or six letters to write. Because they are in difficulty with so many different agencies. And actually, even in their own families, broken up, children misbehaving, and so on. All races are represented, but amongst the groups, the Malay community is overrepresented, which is why I talked a little bit more about this in my Malay speech just now. But it's a problem which we have to address, tackle, and to help these people get their lives in order. Most important, to get their children to be sorted out so their children start off straight in life and don't go wrong at a young age and then perpetuate the problem in the next generation. So that's one of the issues we have to concern with. The other issue concerning low-income families is, uh, is to discuss what we can do to work to build up their assets. One of the very effective approaches which this government has has implemented over many years is the HDB Home Ownership Scheme. We subsidize people to own and to save, but we don't subsidize people to spend. So HDB Home Ownership, through helping you have an HDB flat, we have helped make sure that everybody has a stake in Singapore. And it's a very, very good way to level up our society. So we collect all kinds of statistics in Singapore. One of the groups we look very carefully at is the bottom one-fifth of the population, 20%. We published some stats recently about their incomes, which have not risen as much as we'd like. So I asked for more study of their wealth. What do they own? And you will be surprised. In the bottom one-fifth of the population, nearly all of them own houses, first of all, Secondly, if you take the value of the house, their equity in it, which means how much money, how much is that value for them? 
on average, they have $138,000. That means the value of the house, you subtract the mortgage not paid, but this is what is worth to him. So it's not bad for the bottom one-fifth to have $138,000 of wealth in an HDB house. It will see him into his old age and his family, if he is prudent. Also, they have money in the CPF. So I asked, what about the CPF? Let's look at this group. What do they have there? Well, they have something there. CPF, $33,000. MediSafe, $16,000 average. So you add up, this group has got about forty-nine, nearly $50,000 savings for the future. So I think that we have done the right thing to help provide for this group of low-income Singaporeans, to make sure that their future is assured, that they have a stake in Singapore, that their old age will be to a considerable extent taken care of. But I think we can do more to help them, not to spend, but to build up their assets. And that's why I've asked, we've been studying this, and we've decided that what we're going to do is to have a new scheme, a new CPF housing grant scheme for lower-income families who buy HDB flats. Let me explain to you how this works. When you buy an HDB flat from the HDB, you get a good price. I think everybody knows that, right? Because... We give it to you at below the market rate. It's a discount. It's meant as a hong pao. But the discount, the price is the same once you buy the flat. Whether you are $8,000 household income, whether you are $1,000 household income, it's the same price, same subsidy, same bite of the cherry. So my question is, why not? Can we find a way to help the lower income groups bite from a bigger cherry? I think there's a way to do it. What you can do is, when a family buys an HDB flat, we'll assess your income. And if your income is in the lower income group, then I think we can put a grant paid into your CPF, which will help you to buy the HDB flat from us. This is for HDB flat from the government. And also HDB flat, if you want to buy resale, you get a resale grant. And I'll give you this grant as well. So, in effect, if you are lower income, you have more. And I think if we do this, the lower income, we will be able to narrow the gap between them and the people who are doing better off. The details we have to work out, because you want to make sure that people don't just stop working to get the grant, but we will find a way to do it. I think it's the right way to do, it's the right way to help low-income Singaporeans. So I've told Ngeng Hen, he says, yes, he's going to work hard on this. <laughs> Last, I'd like to talk about healthcare costs. This is a big subject. If I make a lecture on this, we will, not, we will spend a long time. So I will find another occasion to speak fully on this subject. But tonight, I just want to say a few of the things which we are doing in healthcare. It's a concern for many Singaporeans, especially the older Singaporeans and the lower income Singaporeans. So there are two things which we will do. One, the MediShield age limit. Right now it's 80. We will raise it to 85. So that when you are old, when you need the insurance, the MediShield will be there, you will be protected. Secondly, the MediSafe. We will make it more flexible so that for those people who have enough balances and, for those and are still working, then we can be more liberal in the withdrawal rules for the MediSafe. If you are going to unsubsidized wards, A or B1 wards, or private hospitals, that you can have a little bit more out of the MediSafe balance. And if you go for the SOC, Specialist Outpatient Clinics, for major treatments, I think we can allow control use from MediSafe also. I think this will be a great help because uh, even reading the wish list of people saying, what do you expect to hear from the National Day Rally? This was one of them. So we are working on this. 
I think we can improve our medical, Medicare, Med, MediShield, MediSafe scheme to make it work better. These are problems which do not have easy solutions, but I can make you this promise. We are one people together. Growth and prosperity in Singapore is for all Singaporeans to share, and provided you work hard and you help yourself, we will help you to succeed, and we will progress together, and we will not leave anybody behind. Next, I want to talk about education, because in order to remake the economy, then Singaporeans have to be equipped with the right skills and the right attitudes. Last year, I spoke about the schools, teach less, learn more, to give our young more room to discover their passion and interests. I think it has caused the schools to think in a different way, and considerable progress has been made in this direction. So this year, I'm going to focus on post-secondary education especially the polys and the ITEs. We must have an education system which offers first-class education to all and not just to an elite few at the top. We want to create opportunities for all of our people, regardless of the family background. We want to develop every talent, not just, not just those who are academically inclined. And we want to prevent the problem of low skills and low incomes from going on into the next generation. And that's the way we can keep ourselves an inclusive and a mobile society, because if you start at the bottom with a good education and talent, you can move up. That's why Singapore works. It's not just because we have a few stars, but a strong Singapore team. That's why the tsunami operation was possible. You can have the best generals writing orders, but unless you've got the volunteers, you've got the specialists, you've got the technicians, you've got the crewmen, the sailors, the men on the ground, an excellent organization from top to bottom, you cannot deliver. Everyone has to be well trained, know his job. In medical care, it's the same. Why is our medical care good in Singapore? Because it's not just the doctors and the surgeons, but the nurses, the technicians, the lab specialists, the whole hospital staff, the administration. So when you go into the hospital, you can be sure you're in good hands. After your heart bypass, if you have one, your nurse will make sure that you are okay and you won't get an infection and then conk out because of the infection instead of a heart bypass. Or if you have a blood transfusion, you can be sure it's safe. You won't end up with bigger problems from a blood transfusion. Other countries in the region are going for medical care. And they have doctors who are as qualified as ours, trained in the same Western institutions in America and Europe as ours. But the whole package, they are improving, but they haven't got there yet. I was in one country in the region recently, and I'm talking to the diplomats. So they were telling me, the uh, operation costs one half the price in Singapore. So I decided to ask him, where do the diplomats go? They said, Singapore, Hong Kong, or Bangkok. I said, what will you do if you are sick? So the wife said, I'm going straight home to Singapore. So that is the difference between a star and a team. And we want the team. So that means we need good polys, good ITEs, and not just good universities. The polys take the biggest segment of our cohort. 40% of students go to poly. They are really already world class, greatly admired internationally. And I went to visit one of them. I went to Nanyang Poly. I was very impressed. They are close to industry. They can respond to industry needs as the needs change. And they provide practical and useful training to the students. So as a result, the graduates are in great demand, very well paid, and skilled. In Nanyang Poly, the, I saw two things. One was the engineering side. They make robots. Not just robots which can wave their hands around and, you know, <laughs> show that it's alive, but robots for a particular operational use, commissioned by the industry. 
They showed me one which Hewlett Packard had asked them to make. It is a robot to build plotters. A plotter is a big thing which architects and other people use to draw big pictures. And you want a robot on a production line, so you want a real project. The lecturer takes a project, the students work with him, batches of students work with him. This is a real life project which is going to be put to use. In digital animation, they create their own cartoon. If you see Kan Tiong Kin on TV mobile, that's done by Nanyang Poly. Very good. And I asked them to do a little job for me, which you will see later on. <laughs> Two of their students, one is Veridis Liu, the other one, Moon Meng, went to a world skills competition in Helsinki in Finland. 700 students participated from 39 countries. Both of them were top in their class. Viridis was an ITPC network support. It's a guy's business. But this is a girl from Singapore and she won first prize. <laughs> the boy, Min Ming, won in the software applications category. And if you take the whole competition out of the 700 people, Viridis was number one. Min Ming was number two. Best of best. <laughs> the other polys are also creating their own industry niches. So Tamasic Poly has courses in hospitality, tourism management. They do it in Sentosa, preparing for the IRs before we had decided on the IRs. <laughs> Luckily for them, we said yes. <laughs> Nian Poly, Early childhood education, mass comms, film, sound and video. Also very good. How can we improve the police further? I have a few, few ideas. I don't think we should make them into universities because if they start awarding their own degrees instead of diplomas, the character of the institution changes and it works differently. You start pursuing paper rather than applications use, practical results and that's a mistake which quite a number of countries have made. But what we can do is to make it easier for some of the students in poly to get a degree. How? By linking up the poly with specialized foreign universities to run degree programs in niche areas. So you can produce graduates in particular applied disciplines different from what NUS or NTU or SMU is doing. So it's not, just, it's not a poor cousin of NUS, NTU or SMU, but graduates in specific areas which are in demand. So, for example, if you are in interactive media, you can link up with institutions in the U.S., like the DigiPen Institute. They award degrees. If you are in resort management, you can get a degree too. In Hawaii and Las Vegas, there are universities. And if you have a degree, you are in great demand. If you are in cooking, culinary arts, childcare, nursing, then there are top colleges in the US and Europe, and you can link up with them too. So I think that we can make the polys even better than they already are. We also can improve our ITEs, Institutes of Technical Education. This is a brand of education which is unique in the world. Their tagline is Thinking Hands. You think about it, it's a very good slogan. Because your hands, you are doing something, but the brain behind it, he knows what to do. Smart. So when they train, they're training people to be hands-on, minds-on, and hearts-on. So you develop a complete, rounded person. I visited them too. I went to ITE McPherson. I saw their facilities, the students working on their projects. All very enthusiastic. The students, the staff. Very dedicated, self-confident preparing to lead fulfilling lives. So I asked them, where do you get your students? He says, well, they come from the normal streams, many of them, academic and technical, half come from the technical stream. And three quarters of the students complete and graduate and go on and find jobs. Recently, four young girls from the ITE participated in a women's competition is an IBM Women's Conference student contest in Singapore. Four of them, one is a student council vice president, 
One is a budding entrepreneur. She wants to sell gift hampers and flower bouquets. One is a teacher in mines. One is a national hockey player. They competed against university and poly teams in this IBM competition. And they came home with a championship. I watched the little video which they prepared. It's very interesting. I just quote you one bit from Hemalatha Arudas, who is the hockey player. She aspires to be a hockey coach one day. And she says, Never say die. Try until you succeed. When there's a will, there's a way. If you strive hard and work consistently, you will be able to excel. And I think she will excel. So I think we should take the ITE to the next level. One system, three colleges. Sumei is one of the colleges we've built, a big one, consolidated. We are going to build another one in Chua Chukang. We are building one in Ang Mo Kyo. Each one with a critical mass of students, five or 7,000 people, comprehensive facilities and activities, just like the polis, and offering more choices to the students. So you can be academic, you can be CCA, you can take a whole range and go where your spirit wants you to go. So what can we do to make sure that a post-secondary education works best? There's one more idea I think is worth considering. This, is, this arose because I asked the, police, the, the, the lecturers I met at the Poly and ITE, do your students have financial problems? Because, in fact, we subsidize them 90-95% of the cost of the education. They said, well, it's not much, it's a few hundred dollars, but there are some students who still have problems, and we raise money to help them, because otherwise they can't afford it and they may drop out. So I think we should think of a way to make a post-secondary education account for every child. So every student can then draw on this account, go to Poly, ITE, or university in Singapore. How do we do this? We have the baby bonus. Quite a lot of money. Not everybody spends it. By the time you get to school, age six, you're already on uh, EduSave, so you are provided for. So one idea is when you reach school age, we convert this baby bonus money into a post-secondary education account. And we let parents continue to contribute and we match until the child reaches 18. Actually, he's a big baby by then. <laughs> but parents are still responsible. When he reaches 18, we can make sure, or 16, we can make sure he gets into a good post-secondary institution in Singapore. And that way we can get he help each family to invest in the best education that their children can get, which is the best investment they can make. What else can we do? I think we can look one level down below the polys and the ITEs to the intake, the normal stream for the ITEs. I asked Taman, the ITE students enjoy IT. Do they enjoy school? The same, he said, not the same. And I asked the students too. The students say, ITE much better. Hands-on, interesting. They have a choice of different uniforms to wear. But can we make the school better? So that in the school, we, learn, we apply some of the lessons from the success of the ITEs. And I think it can be done. In normal academic, we have already made this curriculum more flexible, given the students more choices. They can take some O-level courses. They can develop at their own pace. Now we should do it to the normal technical curriculum. What can we do? I think first, they still have to learn the basics, English and maths, but we can do it in a more practical way, with group works, hands-on work, more use of IT, so that the learning becomes more engaging. So, for example, in Clementi, to teach maths, instead of doing sums, Clementi Town Secondary School, the students work on their, in groups to plan their dream holiday. So you've got to look at newspaper advertisements, 
look at internet websites, figure out discounts, work out the sums, airfares, work out the sums, compare the best options, exchange rates, arrival and departure times, collect data, make sense of them, and use them. I do, have not yet asked them whether the first prize they get a real holiday or not. But I think this is a realistic lesson to show how math is useful in daily life and the way they are going to use the, the, the skills. So that's one thing they can do. The other thing they can do is to have practical electives so they can develop different interests and talents for the kids. Like digital art, using software to create digital animations and graphics. Or another very interesting one, they make they use natural products to try and make medicine and perfumes. So you understand health science, you understand a bit of chemistry, you understand a bit of biology. You are doing something which is challenging, interesting, which will keep them engaged, which is half the battle to keeping the normal technical students with you. Because if you talk to the teachers who teach NT classes, they will tell you that a lot of those time is spent counseling them, making sure they are motivated. So with this, we can do it. We've already got 39 schools with electives. We're going to roll it out under the new normal technical curriculum within the next two years. So we are focusing all the way down across the broad range of the education system to provide many avenues to suit many different students. We want many different models of success, like the IT girls I talked about showed you, so that you're not all looking to succeed in the same mold but what is your ambition? What are you good at? We will help you to be good at that. And many paths to success. And many opportunities to cross over. So you can start in school. You may go to the ITE. You can come back to the poly. You can go from that, if you do well, onto university or to work or to a professional degree. And many second chances to do well. Because if you flunk out for some reason, but you make good later, we want you back. I met one lecturer at ITE. His name is Eric Chen. He was expelled from school at Sec 3 for playing truant. So then he didn't have confidence to do O levels. He went to the ITE. It turned his life around. From ITE, he went to Nian Poly. Then he went to University of Edinburgh, got an engineering degree. Then he went to Imperial College London, got a master's degree. They offered him a PhD place. He said, no, I'm going back. Now he's teaching in ITE Macpherson. I think that is a good role model for many young Singaporeans. Not to flunk out, <laughs> but to do well. <laughs> so we are aiming for a mountain range, not a pinnacle. We want many routes up, many ways to succeed. If you are a Tetarik man, you must be a good Tetarik man. Pour the tea and turn around. <laughs> Not so easy. Then we'll have Singapore the way we want it to be, with everybody with a place in it. In Chinese, they say, Hang Hang Chu Zhuang Yuan. In every profession, there, is the people, there are the people who are excellent, who are outstanding, who are world class. And I think we must be like that in Singapore. Remaking Singapore includes remaking our mindsets. We have to change our thinking. There are many mindset changes which we need and which from time to time ministers make speeches about. Not being afraid to fail, being willing to try new things, giving people a second chance, adapting to a changing job market, and so on and so forth. Tonight, I only want to talk about one of them, and that is to improve our service culture. It's a critical success factor we are going to develop a service industry. And it's another thing which I picked up visiting Las Vegas. I met Steve Wynn, who owns Wynn Resort and built several of the other resorts in Las Vegas. And they are at the top end. And he told me, the key to the success of a resort is not just the building, the finishes, but the people. Because people come... The guests come to enjoy and they want a good experience. They want to be looked after. They want staff who will take care of them. 
And you have to train the staff, you have to motivate the staff, you have to reward them, you give them shares, you give them recognition, you have human resource systems, you, win, you, you compete to make sure your HR system is outstanding, and then you can provide a good service. And the other resort operators also told me the same. So we have to be able to do that. In Singapore, we don't have a natural service culture. If you compare us with other countries, you go to Thailand, for example, the, whether it's a man or woman, the man will say sawadi ka, or the woman will say sawadi ka. You go to a Japanese restaurant, irashai mase. Or you go to India, they say namaste or vanakam. You go to Australia, they say good day, mate. In Singapore, they go straight to the point. How can I help you? If you are not so lucky. <laughs> if you are not so lucky, what do you want? <laughs> there are some Singapore organizations which do have excellent service standards. SIA, the immigration people are very good. Changi Airport. No, I mean, Changi Airport, the immigration people are very good. SIA, good service. Hotel, retail, food and beverages, they have good service too. But we have a long way to go to reach world class. And I hear of companies that don't really care very much about service quality. This is a problem which has to be dealt at three levels. One, the companies have to have that focus. Two, the service people have to have that focus. Three, the staff, we who are served by the people, we have to have that culture too. I will give you an example each of this. Start with a company because they set the tone. There's one poly student who went to do a work attachment in a hotel, final year. So guests came, had a cold drink, ordered a cold drink, waiting for a friend, felt cold. So this poly student says, I must look after the guest, served her warm water. Got scolded. Yes, you must not serve her warm water. You must sell her a warm drink. So she gave up. She said, I, I'm fed up with this. I'm off. If I were her, I would straight away go and work for the competitor company. But the comp the, obviously, the hotel operator didn't have the sense of it. But sometimes it's a service girl or boy or old person who doesn't have it. So there are many horror stories of bad service staff. I asked for some examples, WDA gave me a fat file. <laughs> so I decided to make a training video. So I will show you this video now. It's called, Tau Gay Not Enough. <laughs> Aunty, two packets. Less oil, no chili, no harm. Five, Hello, Miss. Don't get enough or not? Yeah. <laughs> Three packets. Thank you. Sometimes, sometimes the shoe is on the other foot. So I got another video to show you. <laughs> this one is called Tauge Never Enough.
Nanti terus mau tahu ge? Eh, paket. Ken tumpang si paket. Nanti three more paket. Eh. Uh, Your friend should join the queue. Not your business. If you enjoyed the video, I should say it was made by Nian Poly School of Film and Media. So, all three, whether it's the companies, the service staff, or the customers, all three have a role to play. The companies have to show leadership. You've got to adopt service-friendly policies. You must have the system, the process. You must make it possible for your people to give good service. Like Raffles Hotel, the tagline is at your service. So whatever you ask for, at your service, it will be done. And I think we can do that in our hospitals. Some of the hospitals they use SMS to call patients when their queue number is up, so you can go around, wander the shops, go somewhere else, come back in time, and not miss your number. I think that improves the service quality. You've got to emphasize service training for workers. Not just the frontline staff, but the managers and the senior bosses as well, so that everybody knows that service is important. So you see, organisations like Housing Board, who deal with hundreds of thousands of transactions every year, their senior staff once a year service quality day, they come down, go to the frontline, serve residents coming who have problems to deal with, like. So I've heard that. I said that's good. That's like MPs doing meet the people sessions. <laughs> then, then everybody will know service is important. Then the frontline staff will get the emphasis and the backing which they need. Next, of course, the service staff have to acquire a service mindset. You have to know that and believe that service jobs are honourable. These are not low-class jobs. You can serve with pride and professionalism. And these are jobs which lead on to something. So Ritz Carlton says, "Ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen." So you go on, and you may begin as a hotel serving girl. You may go on to become a masseur, masseuse, or if you are in a hairdressing assistant, you might go on to run your own salon, become a hairstylist. There is a career path up. You start by serving. You learn how, pe how to please people. You can move on, and that's a valuable skill. But of course, you need social skills too: how to carry yourself, how to serve, how to be graceful, and therefore make people happy. One of the difficulties of doing this is that in Singapore, maybe life is a little bit too easy. Why do I say that? I just give you one example: a Singaporean air hostess. Arrived at the destination, found that she had no passport. A commotion. The airport manager came, sorted the problem out, so managed to get her admitted. Scolded her, said, "Where is your passport? Why? Well, how can you, as an air hostess, not do this?" She says, "I must go home and scold my maid." <laughs> Because my maid packs my bag, she, my maid forgot to pack my passport. Is my maid's fault. So, so I think it's a little bit harder to provide good service if you are used to being looked after. But if you look at the wealthy, developed countries like America, you can get good service in the restaurants and good waiters. So I think we can do it, provided we put ourselves to it and pay attention and improve. And we have to reinforce this message, remind us. Campaigns, always. In Hong Kong, they turned around. One of the things they did was to have a campaign. So Andy Lau appears on TV commercials to urge people to provide good service. The program is called a hospitable Hong Kong. So I think we should consider a similar campaign. Maybe we can have Taufik and Sai 
And we can have a GST campaign. Greet, smile, and thank. And we will make a difference. But the customer attitudes have also to change. Because if the customers treat you like dirt, you are not going to serve with pride. And customers have to know, as the actor in this Tauge Never Enough didn't know, that the person is serving you doesn't mean he or she is a slave or a servant. It's he's looking after you. It's your responsibility to be courteous, to be considerate, to res- to be to thank her and to appreciate what he or she has done for you. Good customers get good service, and that I think is something which all of us has, have to change. It's easier to say the serving people have to change because we all laugh at the serving people. But I notice Tauge not enough got more laughter than Tauge never enough. But Tauge never enough also must be fixed. We've put on good shows before. When there's a big event, we do well. The IOC, we did very well. And there are other bigger events coming. Next year, there'll be the IMF and World Bank Conference. 16,000 participants. It's maybe 10 times the size of the International Olympic Committee meeting earlier this year. And we have to deliver the best service level so that the whole world knows Singapore is not just clean and safe, but also welcoming and hospitable. So let's gear up now. This is an effort which we have to continue for a long time. The government agencies will get together and will promote it. And I've asked Raymond Lim to be in charge of this. We'll make sure that we get everybody together. I think he can do that. It's not just for the tourists, it's also for ourselves. Because it's this kind of society we are. What we are, being gracious, courteous, respectful of one another, having, knowing that everybody has a place, a dignified place in Singapore, everybody belongs, doing his part and excelling in his profession and serving with pride. To remake the economy and attract talent, we've also got to remake our city. This has to be a city which is full of life and energy and excitement, a place where people want to live, work and play, where they are stimulated to be active, to be creative and to enjoy life. MND and URA briefed me recently on their plans. I wanted to know what they were doing and they gave me a full explanation, brought their whole team The enthusiasm and excitement was infectious. So I decided to come and share it with you. And to help me do that, I've prepared some slides to show you. Every major city in the world is inventing itself and reinventing itself. New York is the Big Apple. But World Trade Center has collapsed. It's become ground zero. They are rebuilding the World Trade Center Seven new iconic buildings bringing the life and activity back to that part of Manhattan. And this is what it will look like with the tallest building called the Freedom Tower. Dubai, building the tallest building in the world. 700 meters tall, Burj Dubai, more or less. The top is a bit blur because they won't tell you whether it's exactly 700 meters or not. They don't want somebody to build one 701 meters tall. But they're going to have the biggest shopping mall in the world, which we have a little part of because the Singapore firm, DP Architects, is designing it, which was involved in the Esplanade. And they're doing other things too. We have the Biopolis. They are going to go one better. They are going to have one called the Do Biopolis. And they say, we have left Singapore behind. Now, I'm not sure they have left Singapore behind, but I think we also have to move. We shouldn't compete for the biggest, tallest, fanciest, most opulent, because we don't have oil and gas. But we must capitalize on our strengths. And what are they? Our multicultural heritage, our clean and safe environment, our disciplined and energetic people, a cosmopolitan and open society, and then we can make Singapore a vibrant global city. 
not just for tourists, but for our own people, to create an outstanding living environment for all Singaporeans. We will start with the HDB estates, because this is where our people live, and where we want to keep the living environment first class and up to date. We are renewing the HDB estates one by one. This one is Stopayu, where we are starting. It's the oldest comprehensive town, but now one of the most up to date, totally transformed. Nearly all the flats have been upgraded. IUP, MUP, LUP, SIRS, low rise with lifts, you name it, they have it. And we are building new flats, infill development, 40 story flats with million dollar views, which people have moved in very happy, new population. There's a new town center, bus and MRT interchange, aircon, HDB hub is there new shops, offices, restaurants. It's a very successful rejuvenation. Even my own grassroots, Peggy Community Centre, we organise a big national street soccer tournament every year. And the finals of the tournament, instead of doing it in Peggy or Ang Mokyo, we go to HDB Hub. Because there's a natural crowd there. On weekends, 100,000 people visit the town centre. And lots of street life activity, because there's younger population, new flats, young couples have moved in. So property values have gone up. And other towns will also follow. I ask Mabautan, when is my turn? He says, oldest first, A, B, C. Ang Mokyo, Bedo, Clementi. <laughs> but others will come too. And eventually we are going to do all the new towns in Singapore, provided they support these programs. In the city centre, we will rejuvenate Orchard Road. It's one of our premier shopping districts, brand name known all over the world, but it's facing competition from shopping districts in other cities. Nanjing Lu in Shanghai is very swank, so we've got to rejuvenate Orchard Road. We've already done some things, We've opened up, we've now got people, food on the cafes, on the sidewalks. We've got the malls opened up, so from the street you can see what's going on. From inside you can watch the passing crowd. We have vibrant street life, dancers, drummers, entertainers, but we can do more. We'll get the owners of the malls to do more. And if you look at the beginning of Orchard Road, right at the top of Orchard Road, there's a vacant picnic site over the Orchard MRT station, which is very popular, but I think it's a prime site, and what we'd like somebody to develop it, a new focal point with space for events and an observation tower, and we'll make Orchard Road one of the great streets in the world, a place to see and be seen, a place for all to enjoy. From Orchard Road, they will take an MRT, the train will soon take you to Bras Basa and Bugis. And this is another area which we can do a lot with. I went around it. It's very interesting what's happening. We're transforming it, bringing life back to it, activities, making it very exciting. The schools are there. The Singapore Management University, SMU campus, has now gone there. Buildings, Gracious, human scale, open, integrated with the trees, blended in with the old historic buildings. NAFA is there, lots of students. We are going to have the SIA La Salle College of Arts up next year. They'll have a very interesting building. We are building a new art school next to the old cafe building. And if we put them all together, we'll have in that area maybe 14,000 students in the city. And with student housing, which we are building, there will be all sorts of activities. Students will hang out in the pubs, cafes, shops. Some of them will be in the new National Library, where there's a space, this is a picture, using the facilities there. Not just the books or the resources or the internet access, which is much better than before, but also the drama center, the activity spaces, many events to attract people. 
we'll get the street life back also. Along the streets, we've got pedestrian malls now. I strolled along Albert Mall, Waterloo Mall. It's very interesting. People selling flowers. There's a Kuan Yin temple, very popular. Next to that, there's a Hindu temple, also very popular. I'm told quite a lot of people pray at both, just to be doubly sure. <laughs> Why not? And when you come out, you can rub a laughing Buddha for good luck. In fact, there are two laughing Buddhas for double good luck. So, it's something new and exciting, but also something old and nostalgic about Bras Basa Bugis. Those of you who are my age or thereabouts will remember the old Bras Basa Bugis area. So many schools there until the 1970s. SJI, which is this one. CHIJ St. Nicholas. St. Anthony's was there. Raffles Girls Primary School was there. Even R.I. was nearby. And so was my school, Catholic High School. So the students used to haunt the whole area after and before classes. We used to go to the second-hand bookshops at Braspasa Road, all manner of interesting old cheap books and textbooks. We used to go to the hawker stalls along Waterloo Street. Tetare, Ice Kachang, the Indian Rojak was the best. <laughs> Most sentimental of all for many people was the old National Library, because you would spend hours there studying, chatting, part tour. <laughs> Made friends, sometimes found partners, and many Singaporeans were sad to see it go, but unfortunately it couldn't be helped. So we've saved 5,000 bricks and put up a wall in the new National Library to keep the memories alive. But now we are bringing back the schools, the students, and the old atmosphere. And if you go by what the students are saying, I think we are succeeding. I saw an article recently, a letter written by a student in NAFA in the life section, which I think is worth reading a little bit of. She's enjoying it, obviously. She says, there are so many things to do. In between breaks, we have numerous choices of food, from Prata at Al Jalani restaurant, Chin Chow at Fortune Center, and Duck Noodles at Sunshine Plaza. Siti Aisha Mustafa. So I think we will make this again a lively arts, culture, learning, and entertainment center in the middle of the city. And a new generation of Singaporeans are now forming memories and sentimental links and attachments to the new landscape, just as the older generation did. And there'll be one of the things which will anchor Singaporeans in Singapore. The centerpiece of our redevelopment of the city is Marina Bay. This is a unique site. As one of URA's international advisors says, there's no other city in the world which has so much waterfront prime real estate right in the heart of the city. We've got the old civic district, which we've renovated. We've linked it to the new virgin areas, Marina South, Marina Center, Marina East. We're going to build a new downtown on the new areas, link it up with the old city, and extend the city seamlessly into the new downtown. So there's water in the bay, there are gardens, and we will have a garden city by the bay. And if you consider Fort Canning behind, in Chinese they'll say, you shan you shui. Very good feng shui, because there's mountain, there's water. And it'll be our city. We start with the water. We will build a marina barrage to dam up the mouth of the bay. It'll be ready in three years' time. And it'll convert the bay into a freshwater lake. Then we will extend the city around the lake. Business, entertainment, recreation. I'll take you on a tour. We start at the Esplanade. It's called the Durians, but you see in this picture, in fact, it's quite beautiful. And the most important thing is not just the performances inside, but that outside, if you walk along the Esplanade, you'll find lots of life. Shops, food, people strolling, people enjoying themselves. It's like the old Esplanade used to be, only better. We have the old 
Supreme Court and City Hall building. We are going to convert it into a new national art gallery and it will have colorful banners hung up. In case the judges get worried, those banners aren't there yet. That's what it will look like when it becomes a national art gallery. We have the Fullerton Hotel, One Fullerton, the Malayan is there. Very successful, if you go to the One Fullerton, lots of things going on. And we are going to extend it along the front, waterfront to Collier Quay. And at Clifford Pier, we are going to move out the bum boats and redevelop Clifford Pier, and that will be another little jewel. On Marina South, we have the Business and Financial Centre. This is a big development. When I was in MES, I had something to do with it because the banking community suggested, why not make one big development like this? Then you have the facilities for the financial institutions. You get more banks to do more things here. You have office space, you have residential space, hotels. So we put out a big plot to one developer to make an integrated development. We persuaded URA and the other agencies. They adopted the idea. We've had a very successful tender recently. And this BFC is going to provide us with first-class infrastructure, is going to bring in more financial activities, and is going to be a major landmark on the Bayfront. Next to the banking and the business and financial center, we will have the integrated resort. I don't know whether it will look like this. This is an artist's impression. But there's another major project bigger than Suntec or the BFC, and is going to generate tourists and jobs, but also shape the new downtown and round out the bayfront. Then we're going to have the gardens, more than one. One will be next to the IR, colorful flowers like this. One on the other side of the bay, in Marina East, beside the NTUC golf course. And then we'll have a third one along Marina Center. Each one with a distinctive design and character, and we're going to connect them together. So you'll have Marina South, Marina East, Marina Center. And we'll join them up, link them up with bridges, walkways, promenades, so you can walk, you can jog, you can even run a marathon around the bay. And I think that will give us a setting to bring many activities in. Clark Key and Boat Key are already 24-hour zones, all hours of the day and night. But on the water itself in the bay, we can have boating, sailing, racing, dragon boat race here. So putting all these together, we will make our city really special. We're embarking on the journey now. It will take many years to complete. But in five to ten years' time, you can see it taking shape. And the Bayfront will be the signature image of Singapore. And on the 9th of August 2015, our 50th birthday, it will look like this. That was courtesy of Nanyang Polytechnic. <laughs> so the city must reflect the spirit of our people, be well conceived, vigorously executed, restrained but high quality, every aspect thought through, constantly being improved and remade in search of excellence. It will be a city in our image, a sparkling jewel, a home for all of us to be proud of, a home that will belong to all of us. My theme tonight has been remaking Singapore together, to tap everybody's contributions, maximize each person's talents, open up opportunities for all. Each contribution, big or small, is one of many threads that we will weave together, bring together, and make the fabric of our nation. There was a project like this recently. It's called Today in History, Singapore. It's a book done by MOE, but really thousands of students, pupils, were involved. And it tells the story of Singapore through the eyes of a new young generation. 
Take one entry on the 9th of August. This is by a young girl. 9th of August is the day our nation got its independence in 1965. Our forefathers struggled to build our nation and to provide us with a bright future. I feel very happy and proud to be born as a National Day baby. Wong Yun Ting, eight years old, Yo Chu Kang Primary School. The next volume will be Tomorrow in History. And that's for young Singaporeans to write. And young Singaporeans, I expand widely, children, youths, young adults, even adults who are young at heart. You may have grey hair or less hair, but if you have that energy, you are part of this story. And together we will continue to tell a special Singapore story. We must never feel constrained by our smallness. You may be a small country, but you can do exceptional things. Individually, Singaporeans are excelling on the world stage. I mentioned Veridis and Min Ming just now. I take another example from sports. We have two of our students. One is Tio Wee Chin from BJC. One is Terence Ko, who is studying overseas in Melbourne. And they went to the World Youth Sailing Championship. And they became the World Youth Champions in their class of boats. It's the first time we've ever done this in a sailing competition. In fact, it's the first time any Asian has done this. But we can do it. Because, as Dr. Yoon Yong Hong used to say to me, Sailing is a sport where you depend on brains. So, I think we have outstanding people. I think as a country, we can do things better which other people can't. Never believe that anything we can do, others can do better. There are many things which we can do, which other people find very hard. i give you an example. I discussed this with a vice mayor from Shanghai a few years ago. We were talking about salaries civil service, public service salaries, and our system to pay people market rates. So he was talking about himself. He says, I'm vice mayor. I earn the least in my family. His wife works for a state-owned enterprise, earns more. His daughter works for a commercial bank. I think it's a foreign bank, earns the most. So he said, if Shanghai were a country, we could do exactly like you. But Shanghai is part of China. If I do like you, to the north the provinces will complain, to the west the provinces will complain, to the south the provinces will complain, and worst of all, in the center Beijing will complain. So, Beifang your wenti, Simian your wenti, Nanmian your wenti, Zhongyang your wenti. So it cannot be done. He admired us, he wished he could do the same. I had an American journalist interview me once after that. And he asked me, what can you do which others, which China cannot do? So I thought if I explain all this to him, it would take too long. So I told him, I tell you one thing we can do the Chinese cannot do. I can ban chewing gum in Singapore and make it stick. <laughs> can you do that in Tiananmen? So we must have a never-say-die attitude. Ultimately, it's our resourcefulness and our resolve which counts. I met Sheikh Halauddin recently. He's our Silat champion, now coach. He's here somewhere tonight. I asked him, who is your toughest competitor in Asia? In the Sea Games, he says, Vietnam. I was shocked. What does Vietnam know about Silat? I mean, Taekwondo, Kung Fu, maybe Eastern tradition, but Silat. He says, yes. They started from zero, but they decided to learn in 1993. They got Indonesian coaches, too. They started. No building, no gym, no state-of-the-art equipment. Took some metal pipes, tied it together into a frame, put some covering on it, padding, contact sparring. Trained hard, tough. After a few years, they were good enough. They sent the coaches home. They were on their own. Now they are champions in Southeast Asia, aiming to be champions in the world. And Silat is a top sport in Vietnam. 
So we have to have the same spirit, and I think we have the same spirit. After that, I happened to meet our Silat team. So I told them, I said, Sheikh said this, is it true? He said, yes, it's true. I said, what are you going to do about it? He says, well, tomorrow we are going to Vietnam to practice with them. <laughs> Friendly tournament. So they've come back, I think they've done well, and I think we all wish them well for the SEA Games in Manila. So you can feel this spirit in the National Day celebrations. Sometimes because we are here too long and get used to it, you become blasé. But those who see us from afar, they know how unique and precious Singapore is. I recently got an email from a German. He was in Singapore. He happened to be around the Padang on the day of our preview. One Singaporean stranger said, would you like this ticket? Uh, my friend couldn't come. So he went to watch the preview. And he emailed me. Good email, I'll just read you a small bit of it. He said, I saw thousands of Singaporeans sitting there, mostly white and red clothes, screaming, shouting and laughing. This parade showed the self-image of a nation I never saw before. The Singaporeans are one people, and they are proud to be a part of this people. I received really the impression that Singapore is a nation consisting of his citizens and not a nation with citizens. The pride of being a Singaporean was nearly touchable for me in this stadium. And this was all just in the preview. This is a foreign view. I also had a Singaporean view, a Singaporean who's been away for many years, and she wrote to me on National Day to wish me well. And she is Miss Ranjini Tiagaraja, Singaporean teacher. She's lived in Portugal for many years. Set up a language school there in a small town, and she's back in Singapore visiting. So she's also here somewhere tonight. Hi. So I quote from her letter. She says, It's only now that I live abroad that I find myself proudly flying the Singapore flag. Singaporeans inevitably carry Singapore with them wherever they go. And there so a bit of Singapore through which they pass on the will to be the best they can. I have lived out here for 15 years now. And in all that time, my Singaporeanness has faded very little. And I'm very grateful that it has stood by me and stood the test of time. So I think we have something very special here. You remember back, some of us, our first National Day parades, the first few. There were no fancy lighting effects, no video link-ups, no goodie bags. <laughs> Just a parade, contingents marching one after the other. Soldiers from 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, 20th Battalion, 100th Battalion, plus one or two mass displays, lion and dragon dances, and the school bands provided the marching music. I was one of them. I marched three times in the band, once as an officer cadet. One year, it rained, 1968, after the parade had formed up in the Pada. Those of you who were there will never forget it. There was a downpour, we froze, we were drenched. We, our instruments had to be turned upside down to pour the water out. We watched to see if we stood or we would run for cover. Nobody ran for cover. We shivered, but we stood there and we marched with pride. And along the route, the crowds gathered to cheer us. So this was the people determined to succeed, and we did. To start off with parades like that, the spirit is special. But to enjoy a 40th National Day parade in the circumstances which we have, that's unique. It's good luck. It's good government. It's strong people. You look at the other countries which have reached this point after independence, after the war. 
the problems they have beset, the existential angst they feel. I mean, look at Israel at this point in their history, which is probably about 1990. The problems which are almost insoluble for them. But for us, with prosperity, peace with our neighbors, with our people looking forward to a better future, and when you have the parade, the same spirit, the same togetherness, that same conviction that we will do our best for Singapore. So I think with this situation, with this climate and this mood, we have every reason to rejoice. We can do this again for another 40 years, because here in Singapore we've created something which is special, which is unique and precious. How have we done it? It's our people, our ideas, and our actions. Most important of all, we've created a Singapore spirit. We are courageous but compassionate. We are confident, never complacent. It's a spirit which will hold us together as one united people, each one doing his part, each one contributing to remaking our nation and building our home. And together we will make this a vibrant global city called home. Thank you very much. <laughs>